Welcome all um, to the fifth Anam webinar, where today we'll be looking at creation and composition and get a glimpse into the world of one of Australia's most prolific composers, Elena katz -Chernin. Without further ado, joining us from Coogee in Sydney, welcome Elena katz -Chernin. Hello everyone and uh, good afternoon to everyone and good morning to you, Nick. Thank you, thank you. So, you are in Kuji at the moment, but you were actually scheduled to be in Germany, in Kassel at the moment, um, premiering your 10th opera. And I really wasn't joking when I said prolific, because alongside 10 operas, you've written three ballets, choral works, film scores, concertos, symphonic works, chain music, instrumental works. I'm wondering, do you ever sleep? <laughs> I'm just bored too easily. I always have to do something new and... Um, you know, once I've, I, I usually say never again opera, but then of course some amazing story comes up and I say yes again, and this is insane. It's, it's <laughs> um, but I do enjoy it. And you feel equally welcome in all, all sort of genres? I feel they're feeding each other. I, I feel um, that going from a symphonic work into a ballet is actually very fruit, fruitful. It's, um, um, it's a good change uh, for my brain. I love change. Um, and I feel often one work feeds the other. Um, I sometimes find idea that doesn't work in a symphonic work will really work well in a ballet or in an opera or a little piano piece that is just working beautifully on a piano will never maybe work in an opera, but it might. So I like to kind of exchange ideas between pieces. So, so that I'm actually never bored. Oh, fantastic. Now, so our musicians know and have heard numerous works of yours. We've sent through a, quite a comprehensive list. But can you take a minute to tell us about where you studied and your teachers and greatest musical influences? Well, I was born in the former Soviet Union uh, in a place called Tashkent, uh, which is the Republic of Uzbekistan. Uh, when I was four, my parents were by, removed by the government to live in a place called Yaroslavl on the Volga River. And it's not that far from Moscow, but it's quite a hike. You know, it's six hours by car. Um, I had my first musical lessons actually indirectly. My sister has a um, piano teacher come in, into our house and I was four and I watched her have lessons and I picked up everything she was learning and afterwards I played all the pieces. Um, and until then, I was considered a slow child because I did not speak until I was three. And everybody was worried that I was not developing well enough and there was something wrong with me. And when I picked up the piano and played, well, I didn't pick it up directly, but I kind of, I couldn't even, you know, my feet weren't reaching the floor. I was tiny child. I was always in the sport lesson. I was always the last one uh, in the row because they did it by height. <laughs> so I was always the smallest. Um, but I, I, everybody knew from that moment that I had um, certain interest in piano playing or doodling. I used to doodle a lot on the piano. I used to love piano. It was my friend. I used to spend all the time at the piano. So that was my beautiful childhood that I had and my parents were very supportive. Um, they loved it that I could play piano. And of course I went way above my head and I tried to play pieces which were way too hard for me. And it took a while till I actually got even a technique to play properly. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And, um, and your teachers and, and, and formal studies? Well, um, I had beautiful teachers at the music school. Uh, and then when I was 14, I went to Moscow to a special school for very specialized music studies at a place called Gnesin Academy. Um, there were 600 applicants and they took 15. Each, each one of these 15 had a perfect pitch. And we bro then broken up in three groups. And this... Uh, three groups were going on for the next four years. So that was a very intense study of um, listening, dictations, harmony, uh, theory, 
you name it. We had 10 hours a day lessons. It was very intense. Um, I loved it. I lived in a hostel with other musicians, other music students, and uh, we were fighting over the piano time. Uh, in, because in each room in the hostel, there was a piano and we were all practicing all the time and doing work. I loved that time. That was great. So I was 14. So I was young. I had to learn to cook and to look after myself. And uh, it was a very quick growing up moment. And so this was as a piano major? This, no, actually not. It was called music theory major. And okay. piano was part of it. I still had to practice for it. Um, that I did, of course, till we left the country, and that was in 75. Um, and I almost finished my studies, but I didn't quite finish. I was a few months off. And so when I arrived in Australia, I was very lucky. I got right into the Sydney Conservatorium and just went right in. And luckily, they let me do double major, which was uh, com uh, composition and piano. And talking about teachers, my teacher, my beautiful teacher was Richard Toop. He was a musicologist and he changed my life, I would say. He uh, taught me a lot about what goes on, what went on at the time in Europe, especially, and in the avant-garde scene. And he knew everything, every composer. Uh, mostly he actually met them by person and he was Stockhausen's assistant for a while. He wrote a book about Stockhausen and Ligeti and um and probably many many more uh, he was an astounding person um i used to call him walking encyclopedia uh, and he was also very giving and generous to his composition students i was his first student for a few years i was the only one and then he started teaching others because he was actually not a composer and that is an interesting thing a non-composer teaching composition can be a very fantastic thing because it's very objective and there came a point at some moment uh, in 80 where he said, you've got to go. <laughs> you've got to go overseas and study with a, a real composer. <laughs> and then <laughs> he sat me down and we listened to everybody, lots of people in Europe, including Ferniho and uh, Henri Cousseau. And they were my choices. And then Helmut Lachenmann. And I applied to all of them. And I applied for all the grants and finally a grant came through, which was a German exchange scholarship called DAAD. I was very lucky um, to be accepted by Helmut Lachenmann, composer in Germany at the time. We were very fortunate actually at NM to be able to play a work of Helmut Lachenmann's in our opening concert. Very different to every other work that he's written um, in his life, in the fact that it was a very tonal work, but um, as avant-garde as Helmut Lachemann uh, is, uh, was and is, your style of composition is very different. Um, tell us how that came about. Um, actually, it, was, it comes back to one traumatic experience. Um, I wrote a piece for uh, Stuttgart Festival. It was actually Lachemann's referral. It was his suggestion that I would write a piece. I wrote a piece um, in his honor. And somehow I felt the experience of working with those particular musicians and that particular piece I wrote, I felt didn't go so well. So I felt, and I wrote at the time, very similar kind of style to how Lachenmann wrote. I used a lot of extended techniques and that interested me at the time. But that piece somehow didn't quite go as I wanted. It was what I call suboptimal experience. A suboptimal result and um, while it was kind of dramatic for me and upsetting and I said to myself I just won't write music anymore after this because just because the audience didn't clap very much and I didn't think anybody liked it and I felt I failed Lachenmann and I felt everyone I thought to myself I'll never ever write again <laughs> that's how dramatic it was I was 24 I think at the time so what happened is I decided, okay, I will, by accident, I got a job at the theater and I started writing music for theater, for drama and for dance. And somehow through that, oh, that's my piano. But through that, I somehow freed myself. I, because I was allowed to write melodies, nobody said you're only allowed to use avant-garde technique in the theater. 
it's very useful because you can create lots of samples and interesting things in the studio. But you're also allowed to create a song or a little choir piece that everybody sings on stage or it's a kind of a, a let's say it's a thriller on stage you do some kind of a atmospheric suspense music so suddenly i was a kind of a film composer in a way and i was allowed to be myself and i thought what is myself and this kind of tonal world came out of me <laughs> i didn't realize i had a lot of that in me but i was free to do it and five years later or in, in those five years, uh, Hermann Kretschmer, that's a pianist from this wonderful ensemble, Ensemble Modern. At the time, a lot of those musicians... Hey, yeah, ah, cool. Well, a lot of musicians from Ensemble Modern were actually in Hanover, where I studied with Lachenmann. And I got to know them pretty much the first year I was there. Peter Rundel was studying at the time. He's a conductor and a violinist. Uh, Herman Kretschmann's pianist, and we were friends. We, we lived across the road. We, you know, we were like neighbors. We, a lot of us lived right close to the music academy. So that's what happens in German cities. You know, everything is a bit more centralized. And he said to me, why don't you write me a piece? I said, oh, Herman, I don't write anymore. I don't write concert music anymore. He said, I will give you some money and, you, and, and, and it'll be a test if you can do it again. And I said, okay, I will kind of he got a commission and I wrote him a piece. It's called Tas Ten, um, which means like try, you know, feel your way through. There is no direct translation in English. Um, it's uh, Tas Ten also means keys. I thought it was a nice play on words, keys and feel something. So I was trying to find my way through back into this world of composing for concert. And slowly and, sh and slowly and slowly, things started moving up, but really one piece a year uh, until in 93, I was commissioned again by Ensemble Modern, actually um, Center for Multimedia in Karlsruhe. Karlsruhe is a, another town in Germany. That's actually where Wolfgang Grimm, famous, very famous, very fantastic composer lives and used to teach and was a professor there. Um, that's where there's an incredible Center for Multimedia and they commissioned a piece for Ensemble Modern. And that piece had a playback and I worked in the studio and that was Clocks. And when I wrote Clocks, I, what I did was I combined what I knew from the theater. I even used the samples that I did in the theater. I used some of those sounds in the clocks, in the, in, in the, in the piece. And it became kind of the soundtrack um, for the piece I was going to write on top of it. So I created the playback first and the, um, the score came after. So, and with that, I was using tonality and I call it kind of dirtied tonality. So if I have a chord, I'll use a seventh interval and kind of make a dissonance. And so play with melodic harmonic language that we all know, but I kind of mess it up a little because I find messing up, I still do that a lot. I mean, I love messing up what you think is clean and very lovely then you mess it up and it becomes more interesting. And that was my probably last, well, actually the first piece that people took notice of. And last piece I wrote while still in Germany because two months later after premiere, which was on in 7th November, 93, in 94, in January, I came back to, to Australia and I've been here ever since. So I came back to Sydney to live to stay because actually I wanted to write more concert music. And that was one of the reasons I had to leave because I would otherwise just take another commission for a theater work. And it's very hard to say no when the work is interesting. <laughs> you know, many, many years ago in 96, I think I had a commission from Nash Ensemble in UK and he came with that ensemble. So we met through that um, project. I wrote a piece for them and then I, happened to be in London and my publisher said Michael Collins was wants to meet and talk about a commission and so we met up and he said he was making he was getting an instrument made and but I said clarinet and there are not so many in the world and he's specially making it so that he can play low notes of the Mozart concerto uh, and there are three notes extra that you can play uh, you go to a uh, low a and he said would be great to have a companion piece so that he can play 
two concertos in one concert. Um, now that is a big, amazing achievement. That's very hard, as you know. Two concertos is massively hard. Anyway, so I set out to write this piece with, as you said, identical instrumentation, which is just two, um, as far as I remember, there's two bassoons, two flutes, two horns, and I think that's it for, for winds, as far as I remember. And then, of course, there's basic bassoon planet, and then it's strings. And it can be conducted from him. He can conduct it himself. And at first he didn't. Uh, the, um, so I wrote the piece, I have sent him the work, and then I said to him, um, is it difficult enough for you? And he said, it should be as difficult as possible. And if you want to make it more difficult, make it so. So I tried and tried and I had, thankfully, I, I like to do that always, is to leave myself enough time to go back to work and um, make it better, adjust it. So it's very good if you have a few months up your sleeve. Not always possible, but it's such a great gift if you have that. And I did, thank God. I wrote the piece and then I had a few months where it could just stay, you know, just sort of sit around, wait. I sent it to Michael. He said, make it harder, make it more virtuosic, make it, give me more condenser like material. And I did. And um, it became very hard. It goes a lot up and down, up and down, up and down. And of course, we rehearsed in North Carolina was the first performance. And of course, I changed a few things and I adjusted it, adjusted it. And um, later he performed it um, with City of London Symphonia, and uh, he also performed with the Tasmanian Symphony, uh, and with Western Australian Symphony, and most recently he was um, he and played it with Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, and he conducted himself, and that was really fun to watch him. He's such a marvelous. Uh, he's really, truly one of the absolute best in the world, um, and and we became really good friends. And he's a lovely person to work with. And it's, it's just an amazing musician, you know, so inspiring. So, yeah, I hold very fondly that experience. And Caroline, who's a double bass player, said, while there are clear challenges and virtuosity for the soloist in a concerto for eight basses, what were some of the challenges with writing for the rest of the orchestra, having to accommodate those limitations of the double bass in a live setting? Very good question, because obviously I... I've lost my basses in the orchestra. I've actually lost my low um, octaves. So I only had tuba, contrabassoon, and timpani, and cellos, of course. Um, and then, of course, there's bass trombone and so forth. I mean, there is enough bass sounding material, but it was quite hard. And, and also to work out, um, often if you hear bass line as a melody, it may not work because it sounds like a bass line. And it doesn't sound like a melody. And that's the challenge. It was not easy. And I kind of had to keep trying. And, and that's why I had all the sessions with Kirsty and Case, because I played piano and they would um, play what I wrote for them. And I tried to hear, is it going to be sounding like a bass line rather than solistic material? Occasionally, there are moments in the piece where they are actually bass just the bass uh, as they're supposed to be but mostly they're kind of playing melodic material and of course it's a little bit in a low uh, range and that is a challenge i tried to highlight other instruments i also had saxophone and i and i had a beautiful solo for nick um for you if you remember you played the, the beginning of the second movement and that was uh, <laughs> that was divine and I, I i tried to highlight different instruments and there was a piano and there was a celeste and there was harp and there was, um, what else was there? Yeah, of course I had a little bit of, of violin solo uh, in, for the concert master to play. Um, I, I tried to kind of give orchestra a little bit something to play, but also, and this is a funny thing, I wanted to give basses a little bit of time to rest as well. But when they had rests, they started mucking about and they started playing something. And I just thought, they just don't want to not play. So I actually wrote some things during rehearsals. I wrote extra things where they weren't actually playing. In that moment, I actually wanted the orchestra to sound big so that there is no worry about balance because balance is an issue. Any concerto, any instrument, there is an issue. But especially if the instrument is in low register, it's much harder to get it heard. And it was, that was quite funny how 
they just started playing this dot, 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 dot. and so I had to write it in of course because I like I liked what they offered but then later I thought well I'm not sure if it was a good idea because that or I took it away from the orchestra you know so there's concerto is basically a fight well a good fight between the forces orchestra as suppose as opposed to sol soloists and so um you kind of have to be the navigator you know between those forces and say okay now they're in front and now they're in front and occasionally there's horns uh, um, and of course you know double bass sound cannot compete against horns i mean the horns are big and magnificent and i love them all and that's the hard part because you know i love all the orchestral colors and it's hard to choose but um, it took a while. But what's more importantly, when I got to the end and I delivered all the parts and um, I've checked all the parts and I delivered the score to Alex Brigger. And this may be an interesting little story. Um, I won't make it very long. I played it, um, and this was a coming back to Tamara question. I played the ending to Tamara, I played the whole piece and she was the one playing piano in the, in the whole, in the piece as well. Anyway, and she said, you can't finish like that. that uh, because at the end, I had this modulation going as if it starts again, like the piece is sort of something ominous happens. She says, you can't do that. She said, and this is what she said. She said, um, do you want to finish the piece? And the audience says, very nice. It's a lovely piece. Or do you want the audience to say that was a great piece and it was fantastic and the ending is brilliant and we all clap and it's all great. So what do you want? She said, what kind of reaction do you want? Do you want to just sort of finish in kind of not, it was, it's just, if she felt it was not decisive enough. My dilemma was I already supplied all the parts. I gave the score to Alex Brigger. He was studying the score. And at that moment, uh, the rehearsal was still another three or four weeks away. And, and Tamara said, you know, because I was worried, I said, I can't do it. I can't change it because I already, everything is delivered. I cannot go back. And she said, three weeks from now, will you be sorry that you didn't make it better because you didn't, you were worried that the conductor would be angry with you because you didn't deliver. Um, you didn't, uh, you changed your mind and he has to undo his score. You have to change the whole half of the fourth movement, basically, it had to be changed. I basically spent three days completely reworking everything, changed keys, changed a lot of things. My copies worked overnight <laughs> and it was, everything was done by, so that happened on Friday. By Monday, we had a completely new score because I overcame my worry um, that the conductor will be angry with me. And yes, conductor was for a moment irritated, but he said, ultimately, it's your piece. You want to be happy. And he actually was really happy. And, and everybody was happy in the end that I changed it because it was actually a good ending. But uh, I didn't have that. You know, sometimes you need someone else to tell you. you. You write in this orchestral score, it's big, and you put a lot of work into it. But if it's not good enough and it will spoil the whole piece, it's really worth changing. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's not important that conductor might get angry, it's, in which he didn't. But it, it's more important that the piece in the end is what actually is good. And I was very happy with the result in the end. What kind of music do you believe is important for people to have in our current climate? This is a good question. A very good question. I wish I knew the answer. Um, I've been writing strangely i've been writing little pieces and i call them isolation suite and they range from really happy little ragtime pieces to a waltz to very somber and kind of a very dark register very low um slow pieces but also calm pieces and kind of content and cathartic pieces i've also written a piece like bells um and some really punchy works and i've so far i've written 10 or 11. And it, interestingly, everybody reacts differently because I've been sending them to friends and family. And some people when it write, ah, oh, this is, you know, maybe a bit boring, nothing much happens in this piece. But some people say, oh, this is the best piece ever. It gives me hope. It uh, calms me down because nothing happens. So this is the thing. For one person, they want a wreck time and they want to be able to dance to a piece. Whereas other people want, um, something that will just calm them down and has very little information so some of oh, it's very much a tasting especially depending on what that person is going through right now 
not everybody is um, struggling. Some people are. And most, you know, most people have, of course, a struggle. And it's terrible that we can't have concerts right now. But some people are quite, you know, taking a break and, you know, enjoying the break. That can happen too. So for everyone, it's different. Some people are really devastated. So for them, having a fun, cheery piece is actually quite nice. They, they feel uplifted. But some people don't want that. They want the opposite. They want to go with the times and experience the tragedy of it all. Because it is tragic. For some people, it's real tragedy what's happening. Many of our musicians are not only extra, excellent instrumentalists, but they're also composing as well. And what kind of advice would you have for up-and-coming composers, especially in Australia at the moment? Well, the good thing is that the young ones are so tech-savvy and, um, and can really uh, upload their work so easily. So I would say go for it and, and make yourself heard. I think always it's good to do something that someone else is not doing. It's always trying what that is. It's difficult to know, but it's a, it helps. But also um, not to be afraid to fail. I always say that because I feel that's very important because the pressure we all put ourselves under and because we reveal part of ourselves when we write a piece of music, it's very, it's, if you give out your soul, it's open, it's in the public and it's very personal. And if it's worrying if somebody might not like it. So don't worry about that uh, because ultimately you'll write the next piece and you've learned something from the piece before. It's like with my piece in Germany where I really did <laughs> not, I did stop writing. I think that's not a good thing. Go on writing. Always. I think I also say, write anything that comes into your head. I, I have these scribbles. Most of them have rubbish on them. Like a lot of it is not usable. It's a lot of it goes in the bin. But I write a lot of it so that it's like, you know, you pull, it's like a sculpture. You know, you take away, take away, take away until something comes up and you, uh, you say, wow, that is great material. I would never have got there if I didn't write the rubbish material. So let everything, go, like, let, write down or create on the computer, or whatever you do, um, just be free. I think it's very important to not have immediate criticism. Often, I remember when I had criticism and I couldn't write, it was like a block. It was more about having an excuse not to write. Because if you say from the beginning, ah, oh, but that's really bad, I'm just gonna stop. That's, I think it's good to just keep doing it. Uh, even if it's just writing two notes, you know, C, D, C, D, C, you know, whatever, D, any notes, just even random. And that's what I said when I play this game with Tamara, we just play with this random notes. They just in our heads and we just press it down. And sometimes out of those random notes, um, something good happens. I wrote a piece called Three Dances. Once I remember nothing came out and I struggled and struggled. And then I said, oh, I just can't do it. And I just did the fingers. I just pressed the, the hands on the piano, just, like, just or something like that. And suddenly there was a chord by accident. And that chord ignited everything and I sat for another hour and suddenly the piece was born and, and that's the first chord you hear in the piece now. It just came after days of trying something and really <laughs> being tense about it. So I think it's important just to write and work. It's hard work, it's not easy, there's no shortcuts. It's, I always say it's like a, you know, like a dentist, every tooth matters, um, every part matters. So you, it's, you've got, it's, no matter how fast you are, it takes time. 